hello. Welcome back to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. This is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Leanne Lord, and I am delighted to be your host. I am a stand-up comedian, author, Center for Inquiry Fellow, and fellow Earth Dweller, at least until the Vogons of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fame get here. This is, a, this is a very auspicious time. Not only is it Women's History Month and Girl Scout Week. Oh, can't you just taste those cookies? Oh my goodness. Uh, but it is also Freedom of Information Day. And here at Skeptical Inquirer Presents, we are all about the freedom of information. Now, uh, as we all get settled in, and let me see what all means. Okay, we've got 174 of you so far. That number keeps ticking up. Uh, but as you get into the room, again, you get settled in. Uh, I have a couple of quick reminders. Uh, CFI's podcast, Point of Inquiry, is available wherever you get your podcasts. And if you haven't already, I don't know what you're waiting for, get yourself a subscription to Skeptical Inquirer magazine. Um, it's really super easy to do just by going to skepticalinquirer.org. And also, if you have any questions for our guests, and I'm sure you will, please type them into the Q&A box, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. Now, uh, tonight's presentation, uh, The Birth of the Science Communicator, uh, features science communicator extraordinaire, Dave Farina. I mean, he's probably best known for his YouTube channel, Professor Dave Explains, which has over 2.4 million subscribers, including me. Uh, now, while the channel is primarily a database of academic tutorials to help students with a wide variety of subjects, uh, and, and hopefully it, they were trying this, but uh, in multiple languages, uh, Anglais, Espanol, Italian, et un jour peut-être français, selfishly. Uh, but Dave is also passionate about neutralizing disinformation and science denial from flat earthers, creationists, anti-vaxxers, medical hoaxes. I mean, it seems like charlatans and anti-science propaganda have never been more prevalent. Ergo, the stakes have never been higher. And so one of the big questions is how do we know what's true? And who better to help answer that than the author of, Is This Wi-Fi Organic? <laughs> A Guide to Spotting Misleading Science Online. I love that title so much. Um, Professor Dave is really a, a beacon for public science literacy. And he's here tonight to help us clarify the issues and players and to identify the strategies we can use to sort it all out. So please welcome to the Skeptical Inquirer Presents screen, science communicator, Professor Dave Farina. Dave, the screen Hi. is all yours. Sir. How are you? <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, so shall I go ahead and, uh, yeah, I'll share here and, uh, whoops, share. Okay. Should be good there, I believe. <clears throat> uh, so thank you everyone for tuning in. My name is Dave Farina, and I wanna talk to you about science communication today. Uh, so I am a full-time science communicator. That is my career, that is my profession. Uh, this term maybe has not fully integrated into the vernacular of the public. Uh, presumably this is a pretty science-centered audience today. So I think probably most of you are at least familiar with the concept of science communication. But if I'm at a party or something and someone says, Dave, what do you do? I say, I'm a science communicator. Their eyes kind of glaze over. They don't know what I'm talking about. I have to walk them through it uh, a little bit. And so this is the way I like to explain it uh, to those kinds of people. I like to tell them that I'm someone who sits in between the scientific community and the general public. So uh, I, I would even go so far as to refer to myself as an ambassador for the scientific community. Uh, and so the reason for this is that scientists are, are very preoccupied with doing science. That is what they do with their lives. And so they typically do not have the time. They often do not have the desire and frequently don't even really have the skill set required to communicate to the public what it is that they do. It's a dramatically different skill set from actually physically doing science. And um, 
This is actually quite problematic because we cannot leave the general public in a vacuum. A lot of what goes on in the scientific community is actually directly relevant to societal issues. So not all of it. Certainly there's some science that is done that is very esoteric that, that the public may not care about. But there are countless issues that really concern us, all of us. And um, if uh, they, they're not equipped to, to navigate this for themselves, right, there's been so much incredible progress in every single field field of science in the 20th century, that it's just now, it's impossible, right? In order to keep up with the frontier of science, you you just can't do it. You'd have to be a scientist, and there are so many fields of science. So um, that is where we come in. So science communicators, we sit right there in the middle, and we do not have to spend our time doing science. We do not have to spend our time teaching in the classroom. We can devote all of our time towards taking what it is that the scientific community does and and delivering that to the public with with the, with uh, with storytelling and and being able to contextualize information, uh, break it down in ways that they are able to to ingest and and understand. So, uh, as was said, uh, my efforts focus largely on my YouTube channel, Professor Dave Explains. So this is really a database of academic tutorials in a variety of subjects. But as of late, I have shifted a lot of my attention, or at least maybe let's say half of my attention to uh, really targeting very specific uh, purveyors of disinformation, charlatans, frauds, um, uh, peddlers of propaganda that are doing damage to society. Uh, and I feel that this is very necessary. So I've, I've felt uh, strongly compelled to devote more and more attention to this as of, as of late. Um, and I also wrote a book called Is This Wi-Fi Organic uh, that sort of synthesizes these two things, the, the academic stuff and, and the debunking stuff sort of in one nice, neat little package, sort of an, uh, an entry uh, entry into, into this space. So that is what I do. What I want to talk to you about uh, today, I want to talk about who has traditionally done science communication and who does it now, because there has been a marked shift in the way uh, the field is approached and perceived over even just the past five, 10 years. Um, then I want to talk about why science communication is important or integral, dare I say, uh, and then sprinkle throughout some strategies for the future for all of us to utilize to uh, try to spread appropriate uh, scientific information in our own personal spheres. So, um, in terms of how science communication has traditionally been approached, we are likely all familiar with some of these early pioneers. So Carl Sagan was an incredible uh, early figure in science communication, and he was he was an astronomer, right? So he was someone who was a prominent researcher in his field, and at a certain point decided to uh, pivot to an extent and devote a lot of his attention towards public outreach. So he's not the first scientist to ever do public outreach, like Richard Feynman and used to give uh, physics lectures to the public, things like that. Um, but what Sagan did was so unprecedented. What he did with his Cosmos series, he did a tel he, he produced a television series called Cosmos, and um, this was in the 1980s, and, and it was really uh, astounding what he was able to achieve in devoting so much of his time and energy towards curating uh, television content that is aimed directly at the general public and explaining to the public you know, I am an astronomer. This is what I do. This is what I study. This is what astronomers know. This is how astronomers know it. This is why it impacts us as a species. This is why you should be interested in it. And it had a market effect. It had, it had a, a measurable impact at that time on enthusiasm for science amongst the public, right? It just, it, people really reacted to it in a positive way. So, he was definitely uh, a game changer in that regard. And the crop of science communicators that followed roughly uh, emulated this paradigm. So this is your Neil deGrasse Tysons and so forth. People who, again, are specialists, are, are researchers in their field that then decide to pivot uh, towards public outreach and science communication. So that is sort of the mold that had been set and was in place for decades. Now, this is actually changing quite a bit as of late. Uh, again, even just the past five years, maybe 10 years or so, uh, society is realizing that it is not going to suffice 
to simply wait and see which scientists take it upon themselves to decide to communicate their area of science. Uh, the skill set required is so valuable that we are realizing it needs to be nurtured in science minded people at a younger age earlier in their careers. And so what we're seeing is a uh, Programs like uh, UC Santa Cruz has a master's in science communication, uh, communication program. I actually know a few people who have gone through this program and sing its praises. And uh, there are other programs like this that are cropping up. And so the reason that this is uh, the, the reason that this is really significant is that we are beginning to realize that it is not actually the greatest route. I mean, it certainly is a route available, and any scientist who is an expert in their field should be encouraged to communicate their science if they if they feel compelled to do so. Instead, uh, for to, to, to gather a larger crop of science communicators, it is also important to, uh, to find people who have completed a bachelor's degree in some area of science, or a physical science, a biological science, or whatever, uh, whatever it may be, and to then immediately go into graduate studies that focus on the skill set for science communication. So we're talking about foregoing that route of, of specialization, uh, focusing on research first, and instead developing that skill set that uh, that benefits uh, appropriate uh, and effective science communication. Uh, so generalism is now emerging as as something that is uh, that can be very effective for a good science communicator to be a generalist rather than a specialist. So this is significant for a number of reasons. So uh, again, traditionally what had gone on uh, in, for, in academia for science students, as you're progressing along, right, you find yourself doing graduate studies uh, and which can be largely research centric. Now, some people are very invigorated by scientific research. They wake up every morning and say, I can't wait to get to the lab and I'm gonna finish my experiment. And then I'm gonna do another one. And man, this is the greatest thing ever. And that's fantastic. And those people are scientists. And uh, it's great to continue to have a new crop of, of, of brilliant scientists. However, what had been uh, traditionally undervalued is people who find themselves on that track and are very invigorated by scientific concepts, but do not connect with research. I myself was one of these people. I did not enjoy uh, doing research in the lab. I, I, fa I found it monotonous and tedious and had always been much more interested in trying to find ways to synthesize my love for science with, um, with an approach that's more artistic, that's, that can focus on, on other aspects uh, without uh, being research centric. And so um, this again is very important because that skill set is quite disparate to that that is traditionally uh, valued in the sciences. So even if you're writing primary scientific literature, that is not quite the same as what would be effective science communication uh, in namely public outreach, right? The style of writing in uh, primary scientific literature is, it couldn't be more different than narrative driven effective science communication that is aimed at the public. And so the reason that this, that this is so important, the, the, honestly, the singular reason that this is so important is the internet. Right, this tool that I'm using right now to speak to you today, uh, this is something that in Sagan's time was not an issue. Right, when Sagan did Cosmos, the internet was, uh, I, I wouldn't say non existent, but was not integrated in public life. Now we are in a point in human history, it's actually a very interesting point in human history because this incredible tool that is so, uh, is so powerful that has defined a new age in human history. We're talking about the information age um, with the internet. Um, that has been integrated into human life for 20 to 25 years, right? We're talking about seamlessly where you just, you use the internet every, every day. Um, we are seeing the, the profound impact now that the internet has on how we interface with reality. We are seeing how the internet has affected epistemology in a profound way. And we are seeing the pros and cons of that. So uh, obviously there are pros. We're talking about the democratization of information. So everybody can learn anything. And that's very powerful. That's incredible. Um, but we are also seeing the drawbacks, namely the tidal wave of misinformation um, that, it, that, uh, that, could, that is festering all over the internet. So uh, again, because of this incredible progress that was made in the 20th century in all of the sciences, and because the public is so left in the dark about so much about what goes on in the scientific community, this makes them very, very vulnerable 
to uh, to propaganda and not just to disinformation, but we're talking about monetized disinformation. So we're we're talking about disinformation that is motivated to exist because of capitalistic enterprise, right? We're talking about people that are trying to, you know, everybody is trying to make money and people are becoming increasingly good at lying to people to make money. So in, a, in, in the mid nineties, the internet was there, but you know, it was just, it was sort of just for nerds status. People hadn't really figured out how to, how to navigate it. But now with about 20 years under our belts of people really figuring out how to manipulate others on the internet, it's become a cesspool of misinformation, right? And because of that, the, the, the problem is twofold, that the misinformation is there, but also that people have become so numb to the idea of lies on the internet. Everybody knows that the internet is full of lies. And what this has done is it makes people, um, it gives them the ability to reject anything that they want on the internet with the excuse of, oh, that's fake news, that's fake this, that's a lie, whatever. Because we all do it every day. There's so much fake stuff on the internet that we can brush any scientific fact aside using that, uh, using that attitude. So uh, what I wanna talk about is, uh, whoops. So what are the types of misinformation? How can we categorize these? How can we, uh, how, how can, how can we view them and how can we fight them? Right, that's really the the name of the game here. So this is uh, sort of the entry level, the 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 low tier stuff is what I would call the digital snake oil. So you, there used to be snake oil salesmen uh, who would go from town to town and and peddle their their little elixirs, their little wares, um, which obviously had no medicinal value, but they would lie and they'd have their script and and they and they would sell it, and so. This is uh, this is your fake doctors. This is your fake gurus. This kind of stuff. So not really institutionalized lies, um, but damaging nonetheless. These are people who who take advantage of people for money. So this is uh, you know something like the supplemental market. Obviously, is rife with this, and um, unfortunately, a lot of this is perpetrated by chiropractics. So I, I, while I would not say that chiropractics is a sham field inherently, um, there's a disproportionate number of chiropractors who present them themselves as as uh, doctors or as as a type of doctor that they're not um and they utilize uh naturalism would be one of their main tactics the glorification of nature over right we're talking a, a certain kind of imagery certain kind of certain kind of verbiage uh so as to convey the idea of the scientific establishment being uh being evil or unhealthy uh and uh, this uh you know the the rogue peddling the the natural cure uh being being a a better route so naturalism combined with uh, uh inevitably an anti-establishment narrative uh, is is probably the main common thread that I think we're we're going to see uh, that that just goes through all of these uh, types of disinformation, an anti-establishment narrative. And so, in order to peddle this, there there have to be there has there have to be strategies. And one of the main strategies that I've identified is uh, is a bastardization or a misuse of terminology that is not well understood by the public. So uh, natural and synthetic are ones that I have found to be uh, most egregiously misused. So these, according to the public, somehow uh, attained connotations of being good and bad, natural good, synthetic bad. And so uh, so this is this is utilized by those who peddle these narratives uh, to, to sell things. So all natural versus a synthetic uh, counterpart, which doesn't make any sense because these are words that simply detail how a compound comes to be, not anything about the properties of the molecule, right? You could have natural and synthetic counterparts of, of the same molecule. You could, you could make synthetic water if you wanted, and it would have the same properties as any water molecule we know. Um, organic would be another one, uh, the, the sort of the organic craze and how nebulous that term is and how it is really uh, used to, to drive sales. Uh, and even things so so simple as a theory, right? I have found that um, I don't know what happened over the past decade or two, but the the uh, it has deteriorated the, the concept of what a theory is amongst the public. 
uh, I don't know if it has always been this way, but it is synonymous with guess to the majority of the public, whereas in fact, a theory is the most powerful construct in science. It sits above laws in terms of uh, the, the power of, of something or a model as opposed to a law which simply describes something that happens. So uh, one strategy that I like to take is to disempower the narratives by showing people what these words actually mean right, with examples. Um, so one, that's one way to get under people's radar is to sort of, uh, these are people who n aren't necessarily always engaging in conspiratorial thought, but maybe are approaching something with an ignorance of what the basic terminology means. So rehabilitating people towards scientific, t towards, towards science can sometimes be as simple as helping them understand the terminology that is being used to peddle the, the misinformation. Uh, so just an example of this. Uh, just to give you one fun example that I've seen over time, uh, there's this whole subset of the supplements we're talking about, vitamin C complex, right? There's ascorbic acid. Uh, you know, if most of us know ascorbic acid is vitamin C, vitamin C is the vitamin nickname for L ascorbic acid, a particular isomer of, of ascorbic acid. But to some who peddle these products, ascorbic acid is the, is the synthetic imitation. It's actually just the shell of this vitamin C complex, um, which uh, this is what you need to get the full nutritional value. So you don't, you don't want the, the factory one, the, the nasty science one, you want this natural one, which ironically is still <laughs> coming in, in a, in a, in a bottle, supplement bottle. But um, so the interesting thing about this is the boldness, the boldness of this lie to literally fabricate something that doesn't exist. There is no vitamin C complex. It is not real. This drawing is completely meaningless. The idea First of all, that ascorbic, well, he even misspells it, ascorbic acid, but ascorbic acid not being vitamin C just is, is in, in ignorance of what, of what a vitamin is, but um, that it can be a shell of something, and then furthermore, that this exists. So you have a problem here, because this is an alluring narrative to those who enjoy naturalism as a concept. It is a very easy door in to the psyche. So how do you convince someone with no knowledge of biochemistry that this is not a thing? So this is a situation where actually Google can, can be your friend. Using Google appropriately can help people understand what is real. So this is an exercise I like to do with people in, in this sort of situation. I would tell someone, what, how do we know if the vitamin C complex is real or not? Well, let's just do a Google search. If, a, if it was a thing that is real, what would you expect to see? You can even have them make a prediction prior to searching. What do you think you're going to see? If you go on Google Scholar, you'll probably find some papers studying the thing. At the very least, you should find a Wikipedia entry outlining what it is just in plain language. This is what this thing is. But when you search, you do not see those things, right? You see just people selling stuff. So this is a way to sort of show people that even without a knowledge of biochemistry or literally any other scientific field, there are ways to use the internet to get some kind of perspective on whether something is, is real or fake, right? Because uh, lies serve the few and truth serves the many. So when you are searching, being able to interpret Google search results, being able to interpret what is a valid source or not, how many sources say one thing, how many sources say another, wh who are those sources? Why might they be saying those things? This is a way to help people uh, sort of inoculate them against disinformation to an extent when it is very uh, poorly disguised, at least. But um, again, this naturalism, it, it, it really has pervaded a lot of areas of culture. So. Uh, there's a the the anti-GMO craze as well is has it, there's such a fervor to it that you end up seeing things like non-GMO stickers on products like salt and baking soda, which are not biological organisms. So they have no G's to M, right? They don't have they're not organ they don't have genes. They're, the stickers don't mean anything, right? But this is something if you can show someone and you can explain to them how, you know, ask them, what, why is this sticker on here? Why would this be on here? Um, this is just a sticker that says no science in here, whether it makes any sense or not, right? This is not something that can be genetically modified. So the, the sticker is literally meaningless, but it is there because more people buy it. That's, that's it, that's literally it. And uh, just, you can say the same about any alternative industry. So alternative industries, 
have all of these tactics. They have these ways into the psyche. So uh, fear mongering would be the main one. Uh, and so people who don't know anything about genetic modification can look at this and see, okay, we've got some stitches in the fruit and we've got the colored goo being injected, which has literally nothing to do with genes or genetic modification in any way, shape or form. But if you can show someone Right. This is very clear. I mean, this is, I don't think I've ever seen an image that is more blatant fear mongering than this. All right. So if you can help people see how maybe their own biases are, are affecting the way they interface with information, that can be an effective tactic. So pivoting uh, to talk about vaccines, the pandemic has brought about the most intense wave of vaccine hesitancy and anti-vaccine sentiment that certainly I've seen in my lifetime. Um, and so the narratives are uh, the narratives are many because there is such an opportunity. Anytime you have something that all of society is dealing with, uh, this is an opportunity to reach as many people as possible with some brand of misinformation. So the thing that uh, there's a lot of ways we could go with this because I mean I don't have too much time here, but the one thing that interests me most is how we are seeing a brand new tactic of misinformation, and that is to take something that was in the, in the domain of science over a century ago, sometimes upwards of two centuries ago, uh, that has been rendered completely obsolete and, and false, and to simply peddle it today as though it is new science. So it works, it, it makes it very low, uh, it's, it makes it very low, um, low effort because it sort of has already uh, a script about it because somebody was developing it in the 1860s or whatever it is, and then to simply peddle it today as though it is a new innovation. So we are actually seeing a resurgence in terrain theory, which in so many words, because it was competing with germ theory, uh, is, is, uh, is, is essentially a, a denial of the existence of pathogens. So namely, uh, so certainly bacteria, I mean, uh, in, in Pasteur's time, they did not even know of viruses at, at all. But so it is the denial of uh, bacteria, but more importantly, viruses. Therefore, the idea that viruses do not exist. Um, which should sound insane to most people, right? It is a disavowal of an entire field of science. But again, because of naturalism, because of anti-establishment bias, it has taken hold to an extent. So this is a guy, Andrew Kaufman, and he peddles a version of this where he talks about uh, COVID is not coronavirus. There's no coronavirus. It's these exosomes, which are actually vesicles that bud off from our own somatic cells. So they are of human origin. It's us. It's not virus. It's us. Right. Um, now, again, this is completely insane uh, because we know what viruses are. There's a field of science called virology. So this simply does not work. It simply flies in the face of uh, of such uh, irrefutable evidence to the point where we have electron microscope imaging of coronavirus. We, we take pictures of viruses, right? This is, this is a picture, it's a colorized image, but it is a picture of coronaviruses. You can see the little crown that uh, was why we call it coronavirus. So to deny this, uh, to, den to deny the entire field of virology, where we regularly isolate viruses, we regularly extract and sequence their genomes, which are which can be DNA or RNA based, right? An RNA based virus, how could that possibly be a somatic cell? It is not the same molecule of genetic information. It makes no sense. But the anti-establishment bias is so thick that it, 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 if peddled uh, emphatically, people will fall for it. But it, it, is, it is so archaic that it is like peddling geocentrism today. It is exactly the same as saying, no, the, sun, er, the, the earth is the center of the, of the universe, right? The, the sun is at the center of, of, of everything. This is something we've known not to be true for over 500 years. Right, and yet flat earthers exist, which is even worse than than uh, somebody being a geocentrist. So, that's how powerful the anti-establishment bias is. That is uh, this. That is the the common thread through all of this. Um, and then with the vaccines themselves, the all of all of your typical narratives you have um, that uh, that they are not actually vaccines; they are gene therapy, which uh, is just a denial or just an ignorance of the definition uh, of a vaccine. And then you have all of the deaths. So you had the people who said everyone who takes the vaccine will be dead in five years, uh, in, or in two years. <laughs> and then you had five billion people take the vaccine, and they're all fine. And so they just decided to 
pretend that everyone is dying uh, and, and peddle that. And so that's actually been very shocking for me personally. I've found that to be one of the most shocking things over the past year or so to watch that narrative unfold. Uh, purely a fabrication out of thin air that has pervaded so many minds to that they that they interface with this and just latch onto it and and peddle it as though it were real and then uh actually to me the most amusing one is the is the ivermectin thing so you have people that are so blindly anti-establishment that they become hypocritical as you have two establishments that they don't know which one to be anti against. <laughs> so this whole thing with the ivermectin is sort of a, a anti-establishment aimed at the government because the government is telling everyone to get vaccines, right? So let's be anti that and let's have this alternative treatment, which is ivermectin, which was initially developed by Merck, which is a pharma giant. So they're pro uh, they're pro pharma to be anti government in instruction while being anti pharma against vaccines. So that's something that I like to try to show people and go, well, you're pro this and anti that, but you're actually anti both. It, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it's, it's interesting to see people see if that registers. But um, so that's, that's the vaccines bit. I do want to pivot now to two other things. So uh, to relatively unrelated, uh, I also want to talk about the Christian right. So the fundamentalist Christian right uh, is an enormously negative and toxic influence on society. So I'm showing here just uh, the logo of Discovery Institute, which is the pr essentially the premier Christian propaganda mill uh, that exists. And so what this is, um, is it is a, it is a concerted and well-funded effort to, uh, to promote creationism in, in a new form called intelligent design. So it's basically, they took creationism and they slapped a tuxedo on it, is the way I like to uh, convey that. So they find uh, the small handful of people that have any kind of uh, academic background in the sciences that uh, that are creationists to uh, to essentially enact this enormous uh, pseudoscientific propaganda campaign aimed against biology. So this may not seem like too much uh, at face value, but I want to talk about what's behind all of this. This is ultimately uh, a movement uh, funded by wealthy fundamentalist backers that are trying to uh, reunite church and state, essentially. So the first stage of this is uh, trying to get science, uh, or trying to get religion taught in public schools. So this starts very innocuously as, hey, evolution may not be true. What about intelligent design? Surely we should teach them together, um, which again is just religion being taught in public schools. But if you look over here in the lower left on the 20 year goals at the bottom there, it says to see design theory permeate our religious, cultural, moral, and political life political life. So this is from a this is from a, a, a document called the wedge document that was accidentally leaked internally from the Discovery Institute. And they have had a hell of a time since then trying to spin this uh, to to uh, uh, to pretend that they are not actively trying to promote theocracy. But inevitably, that is what they are trying to do. They are trying to promote theocracy, a reunification of church and state. And so this is intimately linked with the rollback of women's rights that we are seeing. Uh, so this is happening actually right now. Uh, Republicans in South Carolina want to sentence women to death for getting an abortion. So we, we're probably all familiar with what happened to Roe v. Wade, which is leaving things up to the states, and some states are taking this incredible, uh, incredibly harsh stance on, on this topic. So... Um, this is this is insane <laughs> and so this is intimately linked right turning women it, taking away women's rights in any theocracy a subservient female baby making population is sort of a cornerstone and so uh as women were the last to get rights as we moved away from theocracy so will they be the first to lose their rights in an in an attempt to return to theocracy and so uh this is what we're seeing and a big part of this uh, is uh, a change in trying to define personhood as beginning at fertilization. So tr traditionally, we're talking about defining personhood as when a fetus is is uh, is undeniably morphologically and, and and anatomically human. So now we're talking about fertilization, 
So we're talking about a singular cell. We're talking about a zygote. And the, one of the huge problems with this, apart from abortion, is miscarriage. So there are other states like Arkansas that are trying to uh, criminalize uh, what they, what some would would ambiguously perceive as forced miscarriage. So a woman who doesn't want to have a baby that forces a miscarriage, and then making that criminal possibly punishable by the death sentence. So uh, this is incredibly alarming because I because legislators who are not scientists do not know how incredibly common miscarriage is and all of the many factors that contribute to miscarriage uh, and how very, very difficult it would be to determine if a woman had miscarried on purpose. And so this is where this becomes the domain of science. It is a political issue, but it is inherently a scientific issue. It is inherently a scientific issue, right? To define something as human upon fertilization makes no sense. A zygote is one cell. How can a, one cell be a human? Humans are not unicellular organisms. But this is not the frame of mind that legislators are using when they approach this kind of thing. This is not about scientific validity, but they are using uh, inflammatory rhetoric. They're talking about killing babies when it is a zygote. You're talking about killing babies to drum up support among the right and get some steam as a political movement. So what is the end game of this, right? I, I'm a big fan of The Handmaid's Tale, uh, partially because of how chillingly plausible it feels um, to, to uh, the, the, the stripping away of women's rights um, under the guise of some kind of divine morality is a smokescreen for authoritarian control. Right. You need some reason to strip everyone's power from them. And so this is what it is uh, in this case. And so what you end up with is uh, is a, uh, a situation where any subversive woman uh, can be put to death really arbitrarily. Right. Just, oh, this woman was pregnant and miscarried. And so by this uh, biblical law or whatever, you know, uh, whatever laws we have put in, in place in this regime, this woman is going to be put to death. So uh, it is about control. It is about control. It is about power. And uh, sadly, uh, I would like to say that this is not something um, that we're seeing in the world, but we are. If you are familiar with what is going on in Iran right now, it is absolutely tragic what is happening and the number of young people, young, uh, young uh, people who are being murdered by the, uh, by the Islamic State um, for protesting simply for protesting, for protesting a, a harsh regime, which should be protested. Um, so this is not an indictment on, on Islam. This is an indictment on authoritarian regimes in general, um, which need not be Islamic. They can also be Christian and have been in the past. So the point is this, when it comes to, when it comes to this kind of idea, what we are seeing in Iran, I'm an optimist. I'm not saying that this will happen in America. I'm not even saying it is likely. But to think that it is impossible is naive. It absolutely could happen. And there are people with a lot of power that are actively trying to make it happen. And the only way to prevent it is to actively fight it with as much might as we can. And so I'm not a politician. I don't have any power in the political sphere. But where these issues interface, with science, which is many of them, right? A lot of this, when you're talking about reproduction, this is a biological process. It is, it is understandable by science. Um, there needs to be more pushback in the science space on this, on this kind of rhetoric. So that is another thing I'm devoted to. Now, this is tangentially related, but what's interesting to me is that um, <clears throat> because it is very difficult to, uh, to, make people enthusiastically go along with what will be an authoritarian regime and thus stripping them of all their power. They need rhetoric. They need some way to rally people to a particular side politically. And to me, what's going on right now with the trans stuff and the gender stuff is exactly that. You have the, the fundamentalist Christian right capitalizing on a particular moment in social development and taking something that is essentially a, 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 a component of a civil rights movement, trans people trying to affirm their identity and get civil rights, and bastardizing it, using rhetoric to mobilize central centrists, people that are relatively cent are centrist, 
over to the right and radicalize them uh, and polarize them. So they are using rhetoric like uh, liberals think that men can have babies. How stupid is that? They're so stupid. Come over here on the right where we're smart and we understand science. We understand biology. We understand that boys have penis, girls have vagina, right? We're the smart ones. Um, without bothering to engage with the nuance that when people say that they mean trans men who can have babies because they have uteruses, right? So uh, unfortunately, I think that while there are impressive figures on the left that are fighting against this rhetoric, it is so much louder and so much more pervasive on the right that they are swaying people to the right on this topic. And this is only facilitating the power on that side to move towards this sort of authoritarian, you know, the theocracy that I was describing earlier. So it is very alarming. And this topic, it, it's uh, it's very important, not just for for the rights of trans people, as important as that is for trans people to have civil rights. It is so much more symbolic uh, than that. And and it has been alarming for me to, to watch this unfold. But um, in general, that's an example of why no science denial can be ignored. There is no area of science denial can be ignored. This is another thing that I have realized because most uh, those who are familiar with the sciences understand the compartmentalization of science. So they might say, okay, look, we got some planets there, that's astronomy. We got some DNA there, that's biology. We got the magnet thing, that's physics. We got the beakers, that's, uh, that's chemistry. The, the majority of the public doesn't view science that way. To them, it's just science one thing. Uh, as a matter of fact, they tend to view it as a dozen or so uh, guys in lab coats. It's all doing kind of all the science together, um, which is just, it, there's, a, there's a chasm there in terms of helping the public understand even at, on a very basic level what science is and how it's done. And so because people are so unfamiliar with the scientific process, the weaponization of the word consensus is something that I feel has been a, a primary tactic. Because if you are going to peddle disinformation, if you are going to peddle a narrative that flies in the face of what an entire field of science understands to be true, for example, the, the terrain theory thing, right? Viruses don't exist. Well, there's an entire field of science called virology where they study viruses every day. So definitely viruses exist. But how do you get people to, to rationally reject that? There has to be a weaponization of the word consensus whereby they take something that once just meant, hey, everybody in this field agrees that this is true. And they have uh, layered on top of that a layer of, uh, of, of evoking corruption that is so thick that now a large sector of the public looks at this word consensus and immediately has a knee-jerk negative response, right? So this has been done very deliberately to get people to reject science because you have to reject science in order to embrace pseudoscience and misinformation. So there has to be a rhetorical strategy to get people to do that. So this is one that I found. Obviously climate is a big one here because of how politically charged the issue is. So it used to be the case that saying that 100% or 97% or whatever percentage of scientists that work in this field agree should have some sway on public opinion. But we are seeing that increasingly over time, this weaponization of the word consensus is starting to have a negative effect. A negative effect. It is actually repelling people uh, to, alter to alternative narratives simply by pointing out that scientists agree on something. So this is incredibly, uh, this is incredibly toxic and, and is a strategy that must be, you know, we have to show people that, that this is what's going on. Unfortunately, the media does not always help. So um, again, because the internet is a capitalistic venture in, in, in our global society today, you have clickbait titles that end up reinforcing this anti-establishment narrative and reinforcing the idea that consensus doesn't mean anything, that what an entire field of science stands for doesn't mean anything and can be overturned by a singular discovery any day of the week. So everybody loves these. You've got so everything in physics is wrong. Science is all wrong. It's all wrong because of this one thing, which is meaningless, right? This is certainly not how science operates and never has been, even in situations where there's been incredible paradigm shift. So like the development of quantum mechanics, that did not render Newtonian mechanics obsolete. It simply relegated it to a particular sphere of experience. Um, 
But because this narrative is so popular with people, for whatever reason, there can be so many psychological reasons why somebody would want to click on something like this, that algorithmically has has honed titles towards reinforcing that idea. Because clicks are books. Everybody wants their title to be clicked upon and they want their articles read. So this has been a vicious cycle, I've found. And I, and I, I, I chastise uh, popular media when I can for reinforcing this. They are actually feeding the fire. It's making it worse that something that is trying to present itself as a pop, as a, as a reputable uh, uh, outlet for the popularization of science or, or science news, that they would uh, report science in this way is, is grossly irresponsible, in my opinion. Uh, an example of this, so again, keeping with this theme of there is no science denial that can be ignored, uh, this is a recent one. I actually had to do a debunk on this because there was that news going around. The James Webb Space Telescope proved that the Big Bang didn't happen. And so every, all of us had to go, is that true? What's happening? What is going on? Why are people saying that? Of course, it can't be true. Uh, it's a very, it's a very uh, uh, robust model. So how could a singular image just turn it, uh, turn it off like that? So it was uh, largely a clickbait YouTube channel. And then you have to follow the rabbit hole and you find this guy, Eric Lerner, plasma co cosmologist, grifter. Um, and then you can discredit the whole thing. But the problem is that, again, anti-establishment narrative, this is how this thing takes hold. And it ends up being enormously problematic because what people do uh, who are not familiar with the scientific process is they say, uh, okay, I knew, it, I knew it, right? The cosmologists were, they don't even know the word cosmologist, the scientists were lying about the Big Bang. So they're lying about the vaccines. So they're lying about the climate. It's all interrelated. And so, excuse me. Um, unfortunately, again, this is the crux of it, this anti-establishment narrative. Any, any type of science denial can be framed this way. And so uh, you have a situation where, again, it is completely narrative driven, where you want the brave rebel to, rebel to win against the big, bad, dogmatic science, uh, ironically represented here as a church, which is what we've, uh, you know, fought against for so long. Uh, this is the Luke Skywalker versus the empire. This is the narrative that drives all of this. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, this is, I, I've only, I only had time here to outline three examples. There are many, many more. And, and I was only able to outline each of them in a very shallow way. I have a lot of debunks on, on these, the Discovery Institute figures, et cetera. Um, but um, in short, I hope that I was able to convey that I believe this to be the premier uh, existential challenge of the 21st century. We need to figure out how to help people know what is true, right? Because, uh, <clears throat> you know, if we can't, this, this is, it is absolutely true that there are other existential challenges. Climate is an ex existential challenge, but how do we address climate, something like climate, without intense societal pressure towards the powers that be to enact some kind of change? And how are you going to get that kind of public pressure unless you have an educated populace that is able to navigate scientific issues, that can know what is going on and know what the best course of action should be and pressure legis legislators to move in that direction. So um, this to me is a war. I think it is a war uh, between those who want to exist in reality and those who want to distort reality for personal financial gain. So how do you fight a war? Well, you need an army. Uh, I think that... Um, you know, uh, I, unfortunately, I don't today have a definitive answer of how to cure the world of misinformation. But the main message that I want to provide is that the way that we will do this in the future uh, is by cultivating an army of science communicators. So embracing generalism, embracing the encouragement of young scientific minds going into this field early in their careers, after a bachelor's degree, going into this directly into graduate studies, preparing themselves for this very important and noble task of helping the public understand what is true. And this is very important, most of all, because there is no one way to do this. I have a particular style, which is very direct, pretty abrasive, and it is effective in, in, uh, it, it, for some people. But there is no catch-all. 
I cannot reach everyone, and there are uh, many other people that will have that will have completely disparate styles. Some will reach children, some will reach adults, some will reach this culture, that culture. They can do SciComm in this language, they can do SciComm in that language. So um, this to me, I'm, I don't have a definitive solution today, but I think that if we can produce this crop of science communicators moving forward through the century, this answer will be found. We will find a way over the coming decades uh, to, to neutralize this barrage of misinformation and help the public understand what is true. Um, and, uh, and we must, or we may not make it to the 22nd century. Uh, so thank you very much. Dave, thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. I, I, I watched it. I'm, I'm listening as a, as a Stephen King fan. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is horrifying. <laughs> high stakes. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, no, no, in, indeed, high stakes. You, you, know, you, you frame it very, very bluntly. No science denial can be ignored. You, know, you, you mentioned uh, The Handmaid's Tale, which I only made it to episode four. <laughs> um, hard to although watch, everyone yeah. tells me it's very hard to watch, you know, I'm listen. The acting is great, the, the writing, all of that is fine, but for the same reason, it felt too real. It feels very. It real. felt too possible. This just it was like an extended um, that that Netflix show, Black Mirror. I'm like, yes, this, this isn't. Thank you guys, but this could really, really happen. It's chilling. Um, yeah, it, it's very chilling. I will, I, I will disagree only on one thing. Uh, with you um, that uh, physics is wrong uh, when it is taught at eight in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was my downfall. Like, okay, we can we just do this in the afternoon? Maybe nine at least. Will... Yeah, at least at least nine at least nine. Um, but you're you're right. I'm glad that you are out here fighting uh, the peddlers of propaganda. I love a good alliterative phrase. Uh, but we do have some questions for you. Um, uh, let's see. Sabrina, thank you, Sabrina, for this question. She wants to know what what would you say to the the many academics who I've met who proclaim that you know science communication is simply beneath them, that they refuse to quote waste their time with the general public. Um, and 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 I, I will say this, I, I do want you to answer that, but I love that what you do is actually separate from what has been historically done in the past. It's not just scientists who have yes. this burden, but people who like you who sort of step into the gap. And I love that. But what do you say, you know, to for, for scientists like that who still don't want to at all? Yeah, I mean, it's hard because, look, every scientist can do whatever they want. Not every scientist has to do SCICOM and, and, and shouldn't. Many can't probably okay. most can't if we're being honest um so it is not that we should convince every scientist to do science communication um but what i would say to, to a scientist that says that it is beneath them and pointless and not necessary that attitude should be rehabilitated is it is not that we must convince that scientist in particular to do SCICOM, but we should try to convey to them the value of SCICOM and how utterly crucial it is at the very least we can we can help them understand the value and that can they can have a more positive outlook on the field and that can you know that can ripple off to to others in in his circle his or her circle um but uh, but yeah, we, we, we you know, that is why we need to encourage young minds to enter the field at an early age so that we do not have to rely on those that are number one set in their ways. And number two, they're busy. I mean, I get it. It's hard. I mean, it, 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 SciComm is really hard. And if you have a full time job to then do so, right, I sit here all day long and think about SciComm. I go, I sit on my computer and I make videos and I think about what do I want to debunk and what do, this is what I do for a living. I think about it all the time. Um, I don't have some other job that, you know, I come home and I just want to relax and, you know, have dinner. And uh, I mean, humans, we're all human. It, it, it's, it's hard, you know, that's why this has to be treated as a profession unto itself. That is absolutely mm. crucial moving forward uh, as a society. Science communication needs to be treated as a career unto itself. And we can continue to encourage any scientists who want to participate to also do that. That is wonderful because we need top minds that are specialists in addition to generalists such as myself. So that's what I would say. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Um, Todd asks a good question. Um, when did theories go above laws? Um, I always thought that that laws were the top at the top echelon, like laws of physics as opposed to theory of evolution. Or we are, am I not understanding the terms? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So this is it's such a common misconception. Um, so this has always been the case, right? A, a law is simply a statement of observation, whereas a theory is a model that correlates a mountain of disparate data. Uh, uh, unifies it under one model and and then can make predictions. So it's a, it has explanatory power. So my go-to example is gravity. You have Newton's law of universal gravitation, right? Doesn't say anything about what gravity is. Doesn't say anything about why matter attracts each other. It just says if you have this mass and this mass, this will be the gravitational force between them. Very powerful, no doubt. We use that that uh, law to send probes through the solar system. Very powerful. But later on came Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is our best theory of gravity at this current time in physics. And this has explanatory power. It explains the curvature of space time and why we see gravitational influence, right? It is a more powerful construct than Newton's law of universal gravitation. Not only is it more powerful conceptually, fundamentally, but it also was able to uh, to find uh, inconsistencies in Newton in what Newton was, uh, it, it, you know, where Newton's law w uh, was falling short. You have the perihelion precession of Mercury. You have all these other things, and it was able to explain those too. So you have something that is explaining not just why something falls to the ground, not just why the planets go around the sun, but also what a black hole is and all of and all of these other um, really strange things that uh, that were in, de in defiance of our, our previous understanding of, of gravity. So um, uh, uh, yeah, a theory is the most powerful construct in science. It is a model that has explanatory power and can make predictions. Uh, so it sits at the top. <laughs> Got it. Got it. You know, it. it I, I'm listening to you and I, I feel like I should, you know, contact my former teachers for a refund because <laughs> there's so <laughs> there's so much that I that I didn't get and that students aren't getting now when you when you mentioned that people are going back and recycling old theories. I'm, I can't help but think that this wouldn't be possible if we were teaching both science and history. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, there's, there's there's so much lacking. Um, that's making your job as a science communicator um, difficult. Um, John asks uh, or, or mentions and he says, thank you for your work, by the way. Um, he would love your take on Robert Malone, especially his science communicator rollout on Joe Rogan, which led a lot of people to say, see, I told you so. This guy is a scientist and he agrees with us. I see you shaking your head. Oh, yeah, <laughs> no, this guy's cashing in. He did a little bit of work with mRNA in the 80s and is now trying to pretend that he invented mrna vaccines he's he's a liar he's a grifter there are this is what is so alarming about what's going on with vaccines right now is it is such a universal it is, it is a topic of such universal concern because it is a global pandemic and it's vaccines that we all are figuring out whether to get or not and so there are so many opportunities to people to chime in different kinds of figures trying to cash in on on what's going on and um you know malone is one of them you know andrew wakefield all of these other figures are just trying to cash in on on a frenzy um and malone is one of them and um Unfortunately, Joe Rogan, um, while, while I do not chastise him as much as others might, uh, it is true that there's a lot of misinformation that gets to the public through his podcast. I don't want to say that it's entirely his fault because he is someone who genuinely is just trying to hear out every narrative and try to figure out what's going on, which honestly we could use more of, like something akin to like a Dick Cavett show or something that kind of doesn't exist anymore. Everything has been polarized to such an incredible degree that everyone is just in a bubble and there's nothing. So I, I do want to applaud Joe for for attempting to have a any kind of guest on the ramification mm. is the popularization the, it, it, because he's the most popular podcast in the world people can go on there and lie it goes over his head because he's not an expert in everything because how could he be nobody is and then you have millions of people that are consuming lies and propagating them so yeah okay okay um 
I'm not even sure. Well, okay, let me ask this question because uh, we are running very, very close to the hour. And there, are, and and let me just say, there's some there's some good stuff in here. Like you guys, thank you so much for for listening so well and and really diving in deep. I wish I had time for everything, um, but someone asked how it, how important is it? And I think you did reference this for a science communicator uh, to hold advanced degrees in science. Right. That- so. So I would make the argument that it is not important. Um, I I do think it is important to hold a bachelor's degree in some science because it is important to understand how how science is done. And with a bachelor's degree, you do get some experience. um, I mean, depending on which science you're studying. Uh, So I took I did chemistry. And so I did I I had chemistry experience uh, in the classroom working on labs. And then I did some graduate studies. I did the majority of a master's program. uh, And so I was doing research. But that is not inform the actual research I was doing, which was very low level. That is not something that I'm utilizing in my SciComm. It, it's interesting perspective. I mean, it enhanced my understanding of what chemists do. But the thing is that science communication, when you're talking to the public, uh, issues, uh, scientific issues of public concern are almost always interdisciplinary. You can take vaccines, right? We're talking about uh, biochemistry slash molecular biology, um, immunology, epidemiology. We're talking about, it it, it seems like it would be one thing, but it's not, it's many fields. And so generalism is a way to get a basic understanding of as many fields as possible so that you can look at these large scale societal issues and be better equipped to know what's going on and how to synthesize them, how to synthesize them, how to communicate them. That does not mean there is no place for science communicators who are specialists. On the contrary, if I have a question about something that is that is very esoteric and and uh, and and is beyond my understanding, I will talk to a science communicator. I mean, I can talk to a scientist who's not a science communicator, but science communicating scientists are generally more available for discourse. So I can reach out to a science communicator who is a doctor or who is a chemist or whatever. So we need those two. But, you know, I don't want to be a broken record, but again, we need a large crop of science communicators. We need many, many more science communicators than we have had thus far because they're because of the barrage of misinformation. We need so many people on this. So we can't just wait to see which scientists want to do it. We need them and also a lot of young people going into this early in their careers. We need both. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm actually glad you just said young people because John asked a really interesting question. Is science communication something that I could take on later in life, perhaps as a primary effort after 60? I mean, does this necess- I understand yeah. the effort, the, the focus on young people, but can, you know, folks who are, you know, making a, a pivot in a, in a career or, or going in a, d- a different direction since lifespans are longer, um, can, is this a yes? Yeah, or, we need as many or, people as we can get. All hands on deck. Okay. We we need yeah. everyone who's who's willing, right? So if you if you have amassed forty years of 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 uh, of experience in a particular field, and then you want to quit and you want to communicate about it, great, do it. Let's do it. We need some. We need people. We need dozens of people like that in every single field of science, and your voice carries a lot of weight in that particular specialization. It does not allow you to to broaden your scope as much because you've been studying this one thing. But we need experts in every field. Right. Generalists and specialists need to work together because the generalists need to make sure that what they're communicating is as accurate as possible. And then the specialists are, are, are experts in that one thing. So they can't necessarily step out of their bounds as well, as well as a generalist can, you know. I, I would say, if possible, even broaden your team and bring in a comedy writer. <laughs> <laughs> To yes, make it sure. funny. That's a selfish, very selfish plug. And I know we're, we're, we're three minutes over the hour, but I, I want to get this um, last thought in because we talked a little bit about this, but I think this is where um, most people uh, uh, arrive at if, if we don't have a strong science background. Um, and this is KK uh, Carney says, what do you think of the idea that the goal of disinformation is not to convince, but to exhaust, numbing the public's drive to think critically? Um, I, I myself have cut back on on a lot, um, but that does make me, I think, a more um, specific consumer. I will actually look things up very specifically instead of just letting myself be inundated. But do you yeah. think that that 
there's truth to that idea or substance to that? Absolutely. Yeah, it's actually something I mentioned early in the talk is that we are so used to the idea of the internet being full of false information that it allows us to reject any information we want just because we're so used to doing that. It's not like when we used to, you know, I used to do book reports by looking at Encyclopedia Britannica, or not book reports, but like, sci you know, in middle school. <laughs> Right. That's a, you but you just book report. Yeah. You know, like a report on the whatever, some science thing. You know, I go to over to the, I literally had the whole thing. That's, you know, <laughs> I'm a little older than I look. I had the Encyclopedia Britannica to go get the thing and you just trust it. And we used to trust newspapers and everything and, and, and the news on top. Now, of course, there could have been prop there was propaganda there too. But it's 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 a different attitude. With the internet, we are so used to there being false information everywhere. Now, how much of that is a concerted effort? to exhaust people with disinformation. I don't know because the thing is that there's there's just so many people. There's so many people and they're all just trying to get their disinformation uh, in there. Yeah. So, you know, to the extent of uh, how much of it is a CIA psyop or something, you know, you could get, <laughs> you, you could go crazy with it. And I don't want to poo poo that. I mean, that's the, the CIA does do psyops, that, that's a real thing. But um, mm -hmm. so I don't know how, how much of it is concerted or not, but it doesn't matter because it's there. And it's enormously problematic. We need to uh, equip people with the tools necessary to wade through this digital cacophony of lies and be able to pick out what's true, you know, with simple things like the Google search and that, you know, knowing how to use the internet to, to be able to sift through all the misinformation. It's, it's, it's its own skill set that should be taught mm -hmm. in school, you know, yeah. Agreed. Um, and speaking of things that should be taught, well, first, I want to thank you, Dave, uh, for, for your presentation, for your time, for, for letting us go uh, a little over the hour. Um, and I'm, I said this to you before we started, and I will say this uh, to everyone watching, um, if there is a rabbit hole worthy of going down, it is definitely Dave's YouTube channel. I mean, the just the lists and the categories and in and, and all the videos that he's put a lot of time and energy and information in heart into, you know, that is, I, I think, um, instead of the next TikTok video, that's the place <laughs> uh, to sort of get get lost in, in, in learning and fun. Uh, so plug for that. I just I just had to because I, I, I very thank much you. enjoy. It. Thanks very much. <laughs> uh, so Dave, again, thank you so much. And I just want to let the audience know that if you missed any of this presentation, uh, it has been recorded and it will be available tomorrow for you uh, to catch up, rewatch and share at skepticalinquirer.org. And as always, uh, my thanks to Skeptical Inquirer, the Center for Inquiry, uh, tonight's producer, Mike Powell. Thank you for being in the background, making sure everything works the way it should. And of course, a big thanks to all of you in the audience. Uh, my name is Leanne Lord. Thank you. And good night. Dave, thanks again. Man. Thank you thanks, for having me. Thanks for being a science communicator. You're great. Absolutely.